and the power imbalance is much more readily available there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with children with disabilities or students with disabilities, um, because typically, it, sometimes it is a physical power imbalance. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, sometimes it is an intellectual power imbalance that's there, but that power imbalance that has to be present for it to be considered bullying mm -hmm. is typically most prevalent when you're considering that disability related population. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. For LGBTQ plus students, they report being bullied on school property 33% of the time compared to 17% of the time of those who don't identify as LGBT and cyberbully 27% mm -hmm. versus 13%. And what's interesting is that students who are not sure, who are still sort of unsure of their sexual orientation, still report being bullied on school property and cyberbullied more than those who don't identify as LGBT students. So even those students who are questioning or are just trying to figure out who they are identity-wise, it's really important to try to think about ways that we can provide supports. Gender. So this is very interesting. I'm going to talk about the difference between bullying with boys and girls. Um, so boys are twice as likely to bully as girls. It's interesting because that's sort of contrary to what you said here mm -hmm. in the state of, was it in the state of Kentucky, yes. it was sort of three to one. So it seems that things may be changing and it might be just the type of bullying. So I believe this is physical aggression, right. probably is what they're talking about here. 25% mm -hmm. um, of boys report being regularly bullied. They're more physically aggressive and impulsive than girls, but they bully more based on opportunity. Mm -hmm. If there's the opportunity to do it, if there's no supervision, um, if there is if there are unstructured times, recess times before and after school. Um, the bullying ends more quickly though. So they often let things go. I think we were talking about earlier that, you know, because it doesn't carry over and fester over, you know, something happens and then they sort of just move on to the next thing. But what's interesting is that people assume that boys don't engage in relational aggression, but they actually use relational aggression. So, you know, name calling and teasing and threatening just as much, if not more, um, than girls do. And that's a recent finding from a study that happened just in 2017 that relational aggression is also happening in our boys. And boys are more likely to be cyber bullies, according to this study. So it's important to just not pigeonhole boys into just physical aggression, but also thinking about mm -hmm. the type of bullying that might occur um, on the computer or cyberbullying or relational aggression. Now girls, 20% of girls say that they are regularly bullied, so not ever bullied, but that they're bullied on a regular basis. Girls tend to bully other girls indirectly or using relational aggression, so they resort to verbal assaults, ostracizing, spreading rumors, gossiping. They disguise their bullying, so it's more difficult to spot. And it's very interesting because I think that that even starts as early as first grade, mm. right? Thinking about how bullying happens, how the exclusion happens, how cliques start to form. Most female bullies do not act alone. Instead, they tend to have accomplices or followers who also su support their behavior. Um, and so it's like, I'm the lead of this group. So if I'm the lead of this group, then I tell you all who you're supposed to like. And I share a lot of stories. So my daughter mm -hmm. was in an after school program and she um, had a friend that she really liked who was friends with her. But her friend was saying, well, while I'm around this other friend, I can't be friends with you, but I really like you. So like the truth is that I like you, but when I'm with this other girl and my, my daughter is seven years old, but when I'm with this other girl, I can't, you know, I can't be your friend. And I had to talk to her about that. So thinking about, and she was like, well, it's fine. I'm the one she's telling the truth to, so it's okay, but it's not okay, right? To have friends treat you that way and ostracize you. So thinking about how young this actually starts. Um, they experience sexual bullying more than boys, so things that have to do with their bodies. And their uh, bullying is more premeditated, um, mm -hmm. thinking about it over a longer period of time, planning out what types of things they're going to do, especially when it comes to relational aggression, talking to their colleagues and their other yes. friends about, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to like her tomorrow. This is what we're going to do. So thinking about the premeditated nature of bullying with girls. Yeah. yeah, and that, that's the difference, boys, it, it's opportunity. When it's mm -hmm. there, it's, I'm going to say more what's on my mind and what I'm thinking and how it's going to happen <clears> right <throat> then, mm -hmm. whereas girls may typically take more time to mm -hmm. think and process through it and get their, their crowd or their following along with them to, mm -hmm. to make it more substantially and, impactful. And as a principal, when I'm trying to get through that, I'm 
you going after the head girl you were talking about there. Mm -hmm. And I said, now don't you do this again or else you'll be up for suspension or whatever. So she backs off. Then the number two in the gang comes up to be the lead. Mm. And sometimes you get into that thing. So sometimes you need to talk to the whole gang, if you will. Mm -hmm. I had to use the term, yeah. the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, talk with them about, now that goes for all of you, not just the leader. Mm -hmm. Any one of you to get involved with this, and sometimes that gets to be kind of like the domino theory where you push one down, you have to get the other ones down as well. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to take a minute and talk about, we're going to talk about race, but talk about how the intersection of race and gender here. So girls, it talks a lot about girls using relational aggression. And I'm currently a professor at UK, but I worked as a school psychologist in New Orleans and in Washington, D.C., more poor, urban, um, predominantly minority serving schools. And I realized that those students were ending, were engaging in a lot more physical aggression. So um, African-American girls were, may have started with spreading rumors and talking stuff, but it always ended with yes. a very violent fight. Um, and so thinking about the different populations that you're working with, it might not just be this relational aggression and then thinking about what is this relational aggression going to lead to? Mm -hmm. You know, it can lead to physical aggression as well. Yeah, and, and where I work in Scott County, I hope no one's watching from Scott County. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so, um, part of what we see, it, Scott County's had a lot of really big growth um, in the last few years, for those of you that are from Central Kentucky. Um, and with that have been a lot more minority students have been coming <clears throat> to our school now um, based on the growth that we have. So it's different to see the way that our students from minority backgrounds mm -hmm. handle and address situations just like what you're saying and we don't have a large staff of mm -hmm. minority individuals where they necessarily feel like they can go directly to someone that looks like them or mm -hmm. acts like them in a sense yeah. um, so the way that they'll address the situation is it's much different and mm -hmm. they say i'm going to fight someone like this white girl mm -hmm. is going to say something to me i'm going to hit her mm -hmm. and then the white girl might be saying yeah, because something completely opposite, but yeah. it's just the way that, that, that things are approached. And I and I think too, it's important to think about what purpose does this physically aggressive behavior serve for the kids outside of the school. So oftentimes, it's it's not they're approaching it from this place because it helps to keep them safe on the way to school, or it helps to keep them safe at home in their neighborhoods. And so this is the type of way in order to keep, especially African American girls, in order to keep from being a victim myself. I have to develop this sort of tough exterior, sort of aggressive stance in order to make sure that I'm not the one that's being victimized. And so oftentimes you'll, you'll see that they're a lot more physically aggressive because they're trying to protect themselves from being victimized. 80% um, of students will experience some sort of gender-based bullying during elementary and secondary school, regardless of their sexuality or gender identity. And bullying can also happen when students don't fit neatly into binary gender understandings. If people don't understand, if we go back to the fact that students who didn't weren't quite sure where they fit and how they were bullied more often, and thinking about those people who might express their their gender in a way that's not traditionally male or traditionally female, what you would expect, then people start to um, pick that as something that they would like to bully those students on. So it's important to keep these kids also um, in your care and under your watch as they're developing who they are. For ethnic minorities, it's interesting, um, black adolescents report a significantly lower prevalence of victimization, of being victimized, than white and Hispanic students. And I say, I'm going to put this with the caveat that I'm not 100% sure that the bullying measures that we have are actually culturally uh, responsive or culturally appropriate for African American students and whether or not they capture all of African American students experiences. So within the African American community and culture, there's a lot that has to do with like Jonin or like they go back and forth with these like wise cracks and witty remarks and so it's kind of like we're going to have this epic battle of words back and forth and now me as an outsider I may be able to look at the bullying definition and say well there's an imbalance of power between these two there's you know it happens repeatedly this but if you ask that student if they're being bullied they're probably not going to say yes because that is just them Jonin. They're going to call it Jonah. They're going to call it whatever they, they call it at the time. So I think that even though they report on research studies significantly lower prevalence, I think that we need to do a better job of being able to measure what seeing looks like across different ethnic groups. I'm not sure if you've seen that in your work in the schools, just thinking about how it's kind of 
fun or funny to say these negative things to other people, even if there is a power imbalance over and over again, and it's just kind of accepted. You know, I say that almost as a peer thing, because back in the day, your term was zoning, is that what you call it? Jonin. Yeah, I don't know okay. what it's called now. I'm getting old. Uh, they used to call it doing the dozen. Uh-huh. And, you know, your mama this, your mama that, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth like that. And they were equal power, basically. Mm -hmm. But it was all he got out on him. No, you got out on him. So it's, you know, the so one-upsmanship type thing. But it sometimes it led into a fight. Yeah. But when you get down to the bottom line, both boys, in this case, mm. were of equal power. So it was not bullying. It was a pure conflict. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's something else, I think, to consider. I think what we see sometimes with our students from ethnic back minority backgrounds um, is the lack of wanting to rat someone else out because mm -hmm. they feel like they're being a narc or they feel like they're they're telling someone else when um, oftentimes, and it's not every time, but it more in uh, the more dominant culture that the students are more willing to, to share that information. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is learned. That's yeah. a learned behavior of not talking to authority figures and not ratting people out necessarily. That mm -hmm. it's a survivor skill that sometimes people that come from diverse backgrounds end up having to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good comment. Yeah, so that's why I think it's also important, like you talked about earlier, of having people, a diverse faculty where people may feel um, more comfortable sharing, who may understand some of these codes that, they, that they're trying to adhere to. Um, biracial, multiracial youth are more likely to be victimized than youth who identify with a single race, and Asian youth are more likely to be victimized than other ethnic groups. Race, oh, yes. Lee's report, I think it's like a racial sensitivity as well. They have different cultures to understand the police. Mm -hmm. So for the Asian kids, they are really minor minority groups in schools. They are really sensitive to refer some Talking uh, words as a mm -hmm. so. So what our um, what our participant in the in the audience is saying, huh? LJ, LJ in the audience is saying is that we may be seeing this this increase Asian youth being more likely to be victimized and she was indicating that they may be a little bit more sensitive to the comments and remarks that that students may be saying yeah race based bullying so 44% of elementary school students and 33% of high school students who report being victimized because of their ethnicity also report bullying others for the same reason but then just <laughs> you looked at me. I was like, that's... No, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you who are... I've been picked on, so therefore I'm going to pick on somebody else. Mm -hmm. and... I'm going to spread the harm. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's a lot within the African-American community related to colorism. And so, yeah, so if you're too dark or too light, then they're going to talk about the fact that they think that you're too dark or too light. And then because someone said that about my skin color, well, now I'm going to go and say that about somebody else. And there are values placed based on the color of your skin, even within the African-American community. So um, that's probably part of the reason why this continues to go on. Those who were born in their home country um, and whose parents were born outside the country report the highest rate of ethnic victimization, and twice as many ethnic minority youth in elementary school report being bullied because of their ethnicity than majority youth. And that's understandable, right? Because you are an ethnic minority, you're different, and people are trying to find something to pick on for you. Um, racial and ethnic minority students may experience verbal harassment, derogatory treatment, and social isolation when they don't adhere to racial and ethnic stereotypes. So when there are particular stereotypes, and there's a researcher um, called, his name is John Ogbu, and some of his research has been, has been challenged, but he talks about the acting white hypothesis. He talks about the fact that if you speak a certain way as a black person, if you speak how I am as a black person, around other black people who don't speak this way, then you'll get bullied or teased because, oh, you're acting white. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so there have been a number of folks who have, um, in the research, disputed this fact. But I think that even in schools, I was just talking to a principal in Fayette County a, a month ago, and he was saying that a number of the African-American students won't sign up for AP or the IB program because they are afraid, and they state specifically that their peers are going to think that they are acting white, that they think that they're better than. And so thinking about those kids who might not fit neatly into those stereotypes, and as a, a black person who went to predominantly white schools, um, you know, I got it from both sides. It's like, well, you're not black enough because you don't speak like us, and you're not white enough because you have brown skin. And so I did feel a little socially isolated um, and felt like, where did I fit in? Or um, 
I don't know if you got, there's um, someone who's famous now who he's a black male, but he likes comic books and he likes anime. And that doesn't quite fit into what people typically consider for African-American males. And he said he was picked on a lot. So thinking about those kids who don't fit in with the rest of the group and trying to identify ways to support them is also important. So how does bullying impact kids? So not only does it, we're talking about how all of this prevalence is, but then what kind of impact does this have? So in academics, it can lead to school avoidance. So mm -hmm. John talked about that. Um, decrease in grades, inability to concentrate, a loss of interest in academic achievement, and an increase in dropout mm -hmm. rates. <clears throat> Specifically, um, for African-American students, um, they had a study that showed that African-American students who had 3.5 GPAs in ninth grade that were bullied in 10th grade actually experienced a 0.3 point decrease in their 12th grade GPA. So their GPAs went down 0.3 points as a result of being bullied um, in 10th grade. Latino students, their GPAs were 0.5 points lower and white students' GPAs decreased by 0 0.03 points. So you can see how this bullying can also differentially impact different kids based on um, who they are. And then more LGBT students and heterosexual students report not going to school because of safety concerns. I think in looking at that slide alone and seeing the group that is not impacted <clears throat> as much, it's, it's typically the group that feels like there are other people that look like them that are there to support them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's administration in the building or the teachers that are there or the predominant um, culture that is around them mm -hmm. feels that's that's mm -hmm. readily apparent to me in, in that slide that mm -hmm. students who are LGBT may not have that luxury or comfort black students Latino students may not have that comfort mm -hmm. so it's the diverse populations again that continue to be more at risk mm -hmm. and that we have to take special consideration for multiple other things we're going to continue to talk about that you know one of the things too that pops in my mind um, back when we were looking at disproportionality issues as far as uh, 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 minority contact when it comes to discipline in our state, there are 10 school districts that have about 80% of the African American population in our state. But we have, when you go across to all of our 173 school districts like that, you'll see pockets of where you'll have maybe in a student population for a district of about 5,000 students, you'll find maybe 100 African American kids. So they're in a very small minority down there, and they are being subjected to more exclusion and more uh, harassment and stuff like that because there aren't enough numbers of their people who look like them in the school and and it, you know it, it's it's a sometimes a very negative cultural thing in some of these communities that uh, that where these kids it's in hispanic kids as well i don't mean to mm -hmm. you know you can exclude them <clears throat> as well and and the further you get in the rural community the more harassment you see of uh, gay kids and and so that gets to be a major major issue of LGBT well. of what, what kind of kids gay children mm -hmm. yeah, you know the all the letters yeah <laughs> <clears throat> mental health so there, it leads to anxiety depression bullies may use drugs to cope with the same mental health issues that cause them to act out where victims might use drugs to self-medicate the symptoms of depression or anxiety that developed after being bullied. And racial bullying leads to stress, anxiety, exclusion from groups, and low motivation in adulthood. And in Bullock County, suicide. Oh, mm-hmm. And these are all things that are going to go back and impact academics as well. The, the mental health component mm -hmm. absolutely is going to go back into how someone is, is, is functioning within a school setting. Yes. Mm -hmm. So just and, because it's it's not necessarily like directly the bullying may increase anxiety that's not mm -hmm. just going to be only anxiety based it, that anxiety or that depression those things mm -hmm. are going to bleed over into all facets of life just like any kind of mental health disorder does yeah right. and i think it's important it might be another place that's better for me to say this but i want to say it before i forget it is that you know there's recent research showing that that racial fairness or even kids who are minorities in settings um, if they don't feel like it's fair. So thinking about solutions, right? If, if their bullies aren't being addressed or they're more likely to get suspended or, or ex expelled or teachers are not identifying their ethnic and racial background but will identify other things, they're more likely to disengage from school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that actually leads to even more disproportionality um, for those kids. So thinking about the solutions, really trying to create a welcoming and uh, and supportive environment for all students is, is really what we get down to. 
So for students with disability, identifying an adult in the school who the child can report to or go to for assistance. Now, some of these things are gonna be, you know, similar for all students. Um, just determine how school staff will document and report incidents. John talked about that earlier. Um, this is really important and specific for disability. So holding separate in services for school staff and classroom peers to help the minders understand a child's disability. There's new research now, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Campbell at our um, institution is doing research on teaching kids about other students who have autism and trying to identify whether or not that helps make changes in how they perceive those kids with autism, their intentions to play with them, their social interactions, and then their actual interactions. What they're finding is that if you teach kids about students with disabilities, they're more likely to engage in the, with them in a more positive way. So we don't just sort of ignore differences. We talk about them and help explain and accept. Educating peers about school district policies on bullying behavior, ensuring regular assurance from the school staff that the student has a right to be safe mm -hmm. and that the bullying is not his or her fault. And then shadowing by school staff, if necessary, uh, of the student who has been bullied in yes. hallways, classrooms, playgrounds, and places where it's more likely to occur. Yeah. So in talking about a couple of prevention strategies, yeah, you can click your okay. too, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Classroom activities with universal design in mind. If we can show that all students that are in the classroom have an equal role or have an ability to participate in that activity, that takes away the power imbalance a little bit. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the concept of universal design, just as exactly as it sounds, that anyone can access that tool, whether it's um, an, an assignment or the actual environment that's there, that everyone can use that everyone can do that type of thing you you design it with every person's ability level in mind um, also again educating peers about just dis disability sometimes this requires to get uh, parent permission to say mm -hmm. you know would you be willing to come in and talk to everyone about what autism is or can our school psychologist or our counselor mm -hmm. come in and talk about what disability looks like we really do see a big impact with that mm -hmm. um, with one of our classrooms uh, we had a little guy with autism and one of my suggestions was this is a first grade class sesame street has a new character um, named julia who has autism mm -hmm. i was like why don't we show them a 10 minute clip from sesame street and just let them understand mm -hmm. because this little guy is a lot like julia mm -hmm. in a lot of ways I understand that this is a this is a characterization of what autism is but at least gets them something from their perspective from a developmentally appropriate level that can help kids understand disability in a different way and it was really beneficial to, to those kids to be able to understand it and see it and and accept them a little bit more. Um, and let me dovetail enough yeah. just a minute. I think there are some nonverbal things that staff members can do that speak volumes to kids. Um, sometimes early on in my career, I was afraid of students with physical disabilities. I just kind of pulled back. I was afraid of people in wheelchairs and things like this. I just didn't know quite how to relate to that. And the, as I grew into this, I found out that I was the problem, not the person who had the disability. I had my own mental disability like that. So I became more overt in saying hello to people who were in wheelchairs or crutches or whatever the case may be and giving high fives and hellos and playing chess with them during lunchtime and things like that. And students who were able, if that's the term, watching me play and can have conversations and be with people like who have issues, other kids decided, well, hey, it's okay, I'll get with those people as well and talk with them and oftentimes our disabled people had more to offer to the kids who are quote unquote able than vice versa. And so staff members who can relax a little bit around students who they may not have in their classes sometimes but have a conversation with them in the hallway in the cafeteria and library, I think sends some really good mm -hmm. vibes out. Yeah. I think the important piece of what you said there too though is that <clears throat> you had to recognize your own weaknesses yeah. as part of that and that's hard for people that to yeah. and it's hard for people to acknowledge a lot of times mm -hmm. but once you recognize that weakness it's about equality and fair treatment for all individuals right. not just that you're putting an additional emphasis for mm -hmm. students who have disabilities or physical disabilities or students from racial and ethnic backgrounds mm -hmm. eventually that becomes the treatment for everyone yes. when we, we recognize our own weakness or our own weak points that we have through that um, additional bullying prevention steps that we can do related to disability, um, creating a buddy system or a peer mentoring. Um, peers have a very strong value. A lot of times our students with disabilities may have an aid with them. It's really hard when you have a 40 year old woman sitting next to you <laughs> to make really good friends, right? So our goal is to sometimes use peer mentoring or peer supports that are there so that way and other individuals may want to offer some support if needed mm -hmm. or other kids may see 
hey, Johnny is friends with, with Jason. Well, I can be too. Because it's, it's, again, acknowledging that right. the difference may be there, but it doesn't have to prevent any additional um, interaction, uh, social or academic otherwise. Um, creating team-based learning activities and rotating students within those groups. So a lot of times in early or earlier grades, um, you have like centers uh, where students will like it, within a classroom, there'll be five different math centers that you rotate through. Um, in some situations, you'll see your students that may receive special education support or have disabilities are working with one individual teacher within that. And sometimes that's helpful to have because they're getting the support that they need. But also that can be ostracizing to a point because it shows that they're not able to be a part of that group uh, or they can't do the other activities that are there. So to counteract that sometimes it's beneficial to have activities where everyone has a role, going back to that universal design piece a little bit, and an activity where everyone can be a part of that. So giving jobs within those activities, mm -hmm. everyone rotates through those jobs, everyone uh, ha plays a role in making sure that everyone has equal access to those roles. So it makes sure that those students that are often ostracized within the classroom or may feel like it or look like it or pulled out to go to a reading group or something, that they have that equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they're, we're showing kids that we don't we don't have to um, separate everything. <clears throat> um, doing social emotional learning activities. Um, there's a program called Second Steps that's really widely used that just talks about how to have empathy and how to have compassion, how to understand your own emotions, how to recognize differences in other people. It, um, it's really great. But there's a lot of things that are out there. Um, it may not sound just disability related, but uh, it, it is a a whole whole mind whole mindset change kind of thing that you can provide through social emotional learning and provide positive helpful and inclusive behavior again allow everyone to participate in activities so that way you can show equality across the board um, be as inclusive as possible with your language um, which is is different for some individuals um, person first language mm. isn't something that teachers necessarily learn when you're going to school it's not necessarily something that administrators learn especially those that have been in schools for 20 and 30 years. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that comes back on the staff training piece of talking about what is people first language or person first language? What does that mean when you use it versus when you uh, use a term that someone's not as comfortable with? Mm -hmm. um, how that can have an impact when it's just your words, you don't mean anything by it. How that microaggression in a sense mm -hmm. is that that's how it might <clears throat> be taken from someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then creating like lunch bunches creating opportunities that are not just academic, that are social, where everyone can be a part of it. Um, you know, you can choose a friend to come with you for lunch. Maybe not just one person gets to choose that friend, everyone can choose a friend. Or maybe you rotate through friends, so that way everyone's getting an equal opportunity. If you see a student being left out in your group, mm -hmm. create the opportunity to make sure that student isn't left out. Um, and it may be forced in the beginning, and you know, someone may have comments about, oh, I don't wanna sit with Johnny at lunch today. Well, let's have a conversation about why you don't want to sit with Johnny and we have to just address it mm -hmm. head on. Again, those co those difficult conversations aren't always fun to have and but they have to occur if we want from a true prevention perspective, not even talking about intervening in a situation mm -hmm. before it happens. We have to do those kinds of things. Same thing with extracurricular after school activities. Mm -hmm. um, oh, having opportunities where individuals with disabilities can participate through those. Um, there's a really cool program, and I, I don't know that it's still occurring, but it was at Beaumont Middle School called the Gummy Bear Project or the Gummy Bear Club. And what it was was uh, like dances and activities and things where students with disabilities were just as equally included. And it was like a peer mentoring kind of group where nothing they did was academically based, but they got together and they planned these activities and did these things together. Mm -hmm. So that way, these students with disabilities could feel included and have a part in this group. And it became something that was really special for those individuals that were there. So some solutions for LGBTQ plus students is to really build strong connections, demonstrate acceptance and keep the lines of communication open, accept them as they are, regardless of how they identify, reveal or conceal their sexual identity. And remember that it's not up to you. And I have to tell my students this, it's not up to you to out them, to share any of this information, right? You know, just being supportive. Again, protecting all use privacy, providing um, interpersonal support to students, providing a safe place to talk about their identity and to navigate decisions about disclosing or concealing it with others. Establish a safe environment at school. So this should be <clears throat> a place where teachers should call out um, 
-hmm. when they see homophobic types of behaviors or even when they say things there was a something that happened at UK or somewhere it was like that's so gay like even saying something like that is offensive and so for people and when people who identify as LGBT see that that's not checked when their their peers are allowed to say things derogatory about a group that they identify with, it becomes a hostile environment for them to be in. And so really trying to create a safe environment for them and also it tells the other students that that type of behavior is not gonna be tolerated. Add sexual orientation and gender identity protection to school anti-discrimination policies. And then create gay straight alliances. It helps to create safer schools and schools must allow these groups if they have other non-curricular clubs or groups. And then conduct social emotional learning activities again in schools to foster empathy. So empathy is huge when it comes to trying to help prevent bullying because bullying really happens